everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our live webinar on behavioral analysis and predictive analytics, the effective approach to ZOS performance management. We will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to submit your questions via the chat box on WebEx. Um, if you have quest questions after today's webinar, please email us at performancequestions at sdsusa.com. I also want to let you know that we are recording this webinar today, so you and others can download it at your convenience in the future. Here's our agenda for today. We'll begin with introductions of our company and our partner, Conic IT. We'll be discussing the issues surrounding IT performance management, behavioral analysis, and how behavioral analysis applies to mainframe performance, and some of the results that you might, be get, you might get from those type of behavioral analytics. And again, as I mentioned, we're going to save some time for questions at the end. I'd like to first introduce our company and our partner. SDS, or Software Diversified Services, is celebrating our 30-year anniversary this year. We're headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and have over 1,000 customers and distributors globally, with over 20 mainframe software solutions and world-class customer support. Many of you are familiar with our vital signs solutions for the network, along with our security solutions for encryption and protecting your network. SDS is the channel partner and distributor for the Conic IT solution for behavioral analytics and predictive performance. Joining us today from our partner, Conic IT, is Jacob Eukelson. Jacob has a proven track record in discovering and developing innovative solutions and has fostered innovation in many different environments, including both research and business settings. He is the senior advisor and director at Conic IT. Previously, he served as the CTO and business development executive at IBM's Global Technology Unit, along with serving as the department general manager at the I IBM Thomas J. Watson Research Lab in New York. He managed a group of 130 cross-disciplinary researchers. Uh, Jacob is located in Israel. And I'm Deb Hodson. I'm located in Research Triangle Park in Raleigh, North Carolina. With 30 years in IT, having worked at IBM, Candle Corporation, and HP, all in sales management and consulting roles. All right, so let's jump into the heart of the problem with IT performance management. Jacob, I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Deb. Um, so uh, if you look at one of the key issues that happen all the time in performance management today, essentially what we feel is one of the key issues is there's just too many inaccurate alerts. And inaccurate alerts cause lots of different problems. Um, first of all, if there's too many alerts, people tend to ignore them. And of course, if alerts miss important issues, then again, people tend to mistrust them. And the reason this happens is that the alerting systems don't really have any explicit knowledge of what is normal. In order to be able to understand whether or not the system should issue an alert, the system needs to understand if the system is behaving abnormally. And in order to be able to do that, you need to be able to understand what is normal. And a lot of this talk will be around understanding and creating baselines around what is normal and then understanding how to use those for alerts. Now, one of the reasons this happens is because of static thresholds. So in order to be able to understand whether or not an alert should be issued, um, people set up various kinds of static thresholds, like, for example, CPU is over 80%. Um, and the problem is, is that First of all, that happens in various occasions, and some of those occasions, 80% could be good. If you have lots of different users, you would expect it to be over 80%. Um, on the other hand, sometimes if you go under 30%, that could be bad because there could be something upstream that's actually causing problems so that you're not getting enough transactions. And so just setting things at a static threshold doesn't work. And finally, by the time you see the alerts, by the time that the system issues an alert, um, what you're really seeing are symptoms. So, for example, you're seeing slow response time. But slow response time isn't really a problem in and of itself. It's a symptom of a problem. So, for example, it could be a symptom of a database being locked or transactions not getting through. Um, and what, what it manifests itself as to end users is slow response time. But slow response time is just a symptom. And that also leads me to the next issue, which is very important in IT today, in that many cases the users are the first to know. 
um, because many, many systems, mainframe including, um, end users work directly with the systems through web interfaces, through mobile interfaces, and they are the first to know when something's broken. And that is not the optimal experience. What you'd really like to be able to do is understand that there's a problem before, and hopefully way before, your users actually know about it. And so going on to the next slide, um, why does this happen, especially in the mainframe? And the reason it happens is that because mainframes have become and are such large transaction-oriented environments, um, this really makes them quite complex. And the interactions between the different things going on in the, system, in the system at the same time cause a lot of these problems. So it's not because of um, the, the QA isn't good enough. It's not because the system wasn't tested enough. Um, in many cases, it's just because the specific uh, instance that's being run or set of transactions that are being run in any instant of time are colliding or causing issues um, around shared resources, and that's what's causing the system its performance problems. So having these shared resources really uh, creates a very complex environment in order to understand that there are performance problems and when there are performance problems. Now, if we look at the tools that exist, various kinds of monitoring tools, and, and, and there's quite a few of them, um, they're great tools. But the problem is, is they give you a flood of information um, telling you what's going on, but they don't really tell you how it compares to what should be going on and they don't show you where to look. And what IT personnel really need is a system that helps them understand not only what's going on, but where they should look and is there a problem. And the only way to get this to happen is to have analytics. In other words, to analyze the system and analyze the performance of the system, understand what normal behavior is, and then based on uh, aberrations from normal behavior, abnormal behavior, be able to issue relevant alerts. Um, going on to the next chart. So one way to do this, and we believe that the, the most important way to do this, is through behavioral analysis and predictive analytics. And so in order to understand whether or not your system is acting normally, you need to be able to understand how your system should be acting. And the way to do that is to understand how your system has performed given the specific environment you're in now in the past. So in other words, trying to use past behavior as an indicator of current performance. Can you click on this bit? And so if you look at that picture, so you know, if, if, if there's just a small aberration from performance, if Bill Bixby didn't become the Hulk, well, this may not be an issue, but when there's a huge aberration of performance, when things have changed drastically and things are not behaving as you expect them to behave, and this, of course, is not a general, I expect it to be less than 70%, but it's I know that I'm on a Monday, the beginning of the month, at a certain hour, a certain minute of the hour, and a certain second of that minute, I know how I expect my system to be working. And if it's wildly off from that, I can start understanding that perhaps this is an aberration to normal behavior, and I need to analyze it a bit more, first of all, but, but in the end, uh, I'll probably need to alert someone that there is something going on. Um, next chart. <clears throat> so what do you need to do? First of all, you need to be able to find or create um, historical behavioral profiles that describe current behavior. So I need to be able to create a behavioral baseline. So again, a behavioral baseline is not a single number. It's essentially a huge uh, um, series of numbers describing how I would expect my system to work in this current environment given what I know of its past performance. So the goal is to find anomalous performance behavior, in other words, find out when my system is acting abnormally, and in many cases, if my system is act acting abnormally, this is an indicator of future problems. <clears throat> this may not have yet manifested itself to end users, but the fact that database locks, for example, are being held longer than usual, or transactions are not going through the system as expected. Um, this, in and of itself, may not be yet felt by end users, but it's an indicator and an early warning sign that I should be paying attention, and there could be very soon an issue that's going to affect my end, end users. And this is just essentially trying to build up the heuristics in some sense that an experienced operator actually uses anyway. An experienced operator knows their system, they know when things are acting normally, they know when things are acting abnormally, and they can very quickly ascertain. And this is, of course, if they were looking at the right place at the right time. So in some, system, in some sense, you want a system that um, 
it acts as if it's an, a seasoned operator, knows the behavior patterns, and is looking everywhere all the time. And so why does this work? Uh, and why do these issues occur? Well, first of all, an anomaly happens way before it's actually felt by users. It's over here in the upper left-hand corner. What happens is something went wrong. Something went wrong with the system. And this is causing your system to act abnormally. And over time, what happens is the actual root cause disappears or dissipates. So, for example, if it was a set of locks being held abnormally, um, over time those locks will be released, and you won't see them if you look at the system. But what, we, what will happen is that there will be something, can you click again? Um, there will be essentially a set of problems that are found over here, um, but this is way after the original problem happened. So the database locks happened over here on the left, and what happened on the right is essentially finally users were affected and they start calling and telling me that things are acting slowly. So what you, what you really want to do, if you click, click again, Deb, what you really want to have happen is you really want to find the, uh, as, the problem as close as possible to the anomaly. Now, if you do that, your life becomes a lot easier. Could you click this? Thank you. And the reason it, it becomes a lot easier is that it's sort of the difference between trying to analyze a problem after the fact and being an eyewitness. Can you click again on this? So if I think of a crime scene, this is sort of an example, um, if I come in late, I, what I really see is just the symptoms or the effects of the crime. And then I need to spend a lot of time analyzing where the issues were, what actually happened. On the other hand, if I can make myself an eyewitness, if I can see what actually happened, in this case I can see this guy sticking his hand through his window, um, it's not a whole lot of analysis to figure out what to do or how to fix it. And so this is what the, I think the most important thing about behavioral analysis and predictive analytics is that if you can catch the problem as close as possible to the anomaly, then it becomes much, much easier to fix it and to fix it quickly. Um, next slide, please. So what happens if you're late? If you're late, what you get to see, and this is probably familiar to anyone using an alerting system, you see a cascade of alerts. You see things right up red all the time, a whole bunch of different things. And now what you're actually seeing is the symptoms being, you're being alerted to the symptoms of the problem. And there's lots of symptoms to the problem, so you're being alerted over and over again to the symptoms of the problem. So let's imagine what would happen if I could actually do this earlier. Um, okay, if you could, so if I could do it earlier, and we'll see this in a second, I would be able to go in and see what the root cause is. But since I can see the root cause, I'm going to start analyzing those symptoms, and what I'm going to find out is, if I look at this graph here, I can see that I'm way over capacity, right? I mean, I'm uh, um, using up my CPU. I'm not able to provide the level of um, support, or the CPU is not able to provide the level of performance that ex is expected. So maybe I'm having a capacity problem. Maybe I need to increase my CPU. Next chart, please. Maybe it's a problem with the database. Again, one of the symptoms that we saw earlier is that, you know, the CPU, um, I was seeing slow response time. CPU was um, overloaded. And here I'm seeing that I'm having problems with the database. The database is not being able to keep up with the transactions that it needs to handle. So maybe it's a capacity problem. Maybe it's a database problem. Um, maybe there's some issue I need to do with my database. Maybe I need to upgrade it. But as I said earlier, if you could turn back and if you could get to the um, root cause, could you click again? That, then I would be able to understand what was happening before I saw those cascading errors. So if I could really turn back time and look and say, hey, what actually happened right before I was seeing all those errors? Well, then I would be able to understand that this is the issue, right? I have a certain task that's causing a problem. Um, and then I could actually focus my efforts on that specific task to understand what was going on. So I don't really need to turn back time. What I really need is a tool that was capturing everything from when the anomaly happened all through the different stages and symptoms. So if I capture the anomaly early on, I've actually captured it very close to the root cause. Next chart. So, and of course, once I can do that, the problem becomes similar. Right? When I can look and click again, yep. um, so if I could actually have had that information at the right time, what I would have been able to see is there's a problem with this specific task. It's just
doing something unusual, abnormal, and this is causing my system to react abnormally and unusually. So if I see that, then it sort of becomes clear. Um, I'm not having a capacity problem. I'm not having a database problem. What I really need to do is understand, is there something to do about this task? And then, of course, it's up to the system programmers that understand the system to decide what to do. They may say this is a real issue and they need to pull down this, um, this set of tasks if that's a problem, or they could just decide to ignore it because it could be just a point in time thing that they know will pass and they can continue on. So again, um, once you find out things very close to where they happen, if you find the anomalies close to where, when they um, actually happen, root cause analysis becomes much, much simpler. Go to the next chart. So that was a lot of background just trying to explain why if you could do this kind of statistical analysis, if you could do predictive analytics and beha um, based on behavioral analysis, um, it could provide lots of benefits. So how do you go about doing it? So one way to look at it is say, well, this is a statistical problem, right? Prediction is done in lots of different systems. You know, there's prediction for um, the stock market. There's prediction for mechanical failures. There's lots of different kinds of mechanisms you could use um, using SAS or some generic BI system um, to, to apply various kinds of statistical models and try to understand how this affects the form performance of your system. Now, the good, uh, um, the good uh, um, part about this is that if you do it this way, it really is general. You can use essentially a set of algorithms for any kind of predictive problem that you have, from the stock market, um, through mechanical failure, down to performance issues. The problem is, of course, is that you use generic, problem, uh, generic models like that, they don't really work well, um, because they don't understand anything about the domain that you're talking about, and, they're trying to, and you're trying to fit it to general problems, and in most cases, um, it requires a lot of knowledge of the domain to build up a, a good, and working model. Could you click on the next chart? So how can you do it then? Well, the way to do it is actually to build up specific models for the domain that you're interested in. So you want to be able to do generic mathematical models because there are some parts here that are gen generic. But on the other hand, you need to add to that domain expertise. And there's lots of different kinds of domain expertise you can build into these models as you're building them. Well, you can do certain things about the actual physical uh, characteristics. Um, for example, if you must be positive, if you can never be a, number, um, a negative number, which is kind of trivial, but you can build that kind of knowledge into your domain expertise, and that actually strengthens your model because it means not every single possible solution is a viable solution. It needs to understand things about performance. Um, and again, um, locked resources uh, are very important indicators and very important things to measure when you're interested in performance. So again, building the model based on knowledge of performance gives you a much better, more exact model. And of course, it, we wanted to understand about mainframes. And mainframes do work a little bit differently than um, many um, distributed systems. They rely very, mainframes rely he very heavily on queues. So um, again, it's very good to have models that are generic and need those as the basis, but you need to be able to apply on top of them specific models that, are, that help you understand or that help the model understand the domain. And the way to architect this is essentially to build um, separation of concerns, some things that are generic, and then becoming more and more specific about the domain that you're trying to model. Next chart. So what do we mean when I say, um, domain expertise. So for example, uh, what do you want to collect? That, is, of course, is one of the most important considerations when you're trying to figure out what you want to be able to predict and measure. So what are the variables that actually affect the things that you're interested in? Now, the variables themselves may be a single variable that you get from your monitor, um, or it can be a combination of variables. And of course, monitors give you all the information that they can. They don't necessarily try to give you the information only that is relevant for modeling. So when you build your model, you want to be able to gather the relevant information from your monitors. And again, you may want to be able to gather it from different monitors. So you want to be able to gather it from your DB2 monitor, from your MDS monitor, from your Kix monitor, and correlate that information together. And even if you're gathering it just from your Kix monitor, you want to be able to gather certain variables and create a synthetic variable or a combined variable that actually you can use to give you better indi indicator of performance issues. And 
one of the big issues around, especially mainframe or and, and, and computer performance, is that there are lots and lots of parameters. Essentially, you can measure just about anything, and you can get information just about anything. There's way too much um, information out there for even a computer model to be able to manage. So you need to be able to cut down the number of parameters being watched so that you can actually have a manageable set that can really be used and you can be used to predict problems. And then you need to be able to find what an anomaly is. Not everything is an anomaly. Uh, and in production systems, a couple of the things that you tend to see are time-related anomalies. Um, things are not working relative to the amount, uh, to the time of the day that I'm in, because um, again, in production systems, things tend to have a periodic kind of uh, um, activity. Uh, but there's other kinds of, of activities too that make sense. Work-related activities. Work-related activities mean that a certain amount of work needs to be done in a certain amount of time. And if the resources ex exist to allow you to get it done quickly, you'll see a peak where it gets done much more quickly. If the resources don't exist to allow it to get done quickly, it gets spread out over a longer period of time. But it's the same unit of work that needs to get done. And finally, if you could really understand this and you could create, uh, create this prediction and understand how your system should be active, acting, then you can apply these, this, this knowledge to create dynamic thresholds. And if you have dynamic thresholds, there's a lot you can do with it. So a dynamic threshold is finding an anomaly that says, look, I think the system is acting unusually at the moment. Um, the, the, the system that's monitoring could do a few things. It can do nothing. It can decide to collect information. And that's what we saw earlier. If it starts collecting information close to where the anomaly happened, you'll have much more information close to the root cause of the issue. It could decide to acquire more data. So it could say, look, I think there's an issue here. I don't really know whether or not there is an issue. So why don't I collect some more information to try to validate my hypotheses about the fact that there is actually some issues there. And finally, it can do the most drastic thing, which is an alert. In other words, get people um, uh, uh, um, informed and get them to do something about this. Next chart, please. So how do you do a performance-informed prediction model? As I said earlier, the first thing you want to be able to do is to have domain awareness. You want to be able to have this domain awareness that knows things about performance monitoring, and you want it to be able to help you pick out what are the various kinds of parameters that you really want to look at. Some of these parameters will be system-specific parameters, things that come directly from your monitors, and some of them will be synthetic parameters, things that are combined either across monitors or different kinds of um, measurements from a single monitor. Then you want to take this and put this into a generic model. Um, so you're sort of like, I want to be able to build up a model, again, generic with domain expertise, to, to create what, as, as we look at this green highway there, what I think the normal bounds are for this variable or set of variables. So this is how I expect it to, to, to um, behave. Now, if I look at this um, graph and you see the actual spiky graph in the middle, the green uh, area shows me how my prediction expected things to happen. This is the actual measurements that are going on. And of course, if you look, I, the things that I've measured is in the past, and then I have a prediction of the future. I now have a prediction of how I expect my system to behave. But if I look at this area where the graph has gone outside my green highlight, in other words, it's gone outside of my predictive area, I need to decide whether or not I want to alert to this. Because as I said earlier, sometimes I want to gather more information. Um, sometimes I want to be able to alert. So I have to decide, is this really important enough? Is this something I want to do in order to create an alert? And one more click there. And of course, on top of all that, even though this may be something that is an anomaly, and it's kind of important, but of course it may be in a subsystem that nobody really cares about, or a task that's not really important. Um, and so in that case, you need to be able to configure this to ignore things that even though from a mathematical perspective or from a domain perspective, they really should be alerted but you don't want to alert them because of the specific characteristics of the installation. Next chart. So here's some examples of the kinds of information that, that get collected when you want to be able to do behavioral analysis uh, uh, and, and predictive analytics. 
So there's things you may want to create from your MBS monitor. You know, we want to find out how your LPR, LPARs are doing, um, your four-hour rolling average, because this could, of course, generate different kinds of um, costs and especially processor users. So there's a bunch of things that you want to be able to do at the MDS at the system level and collect that information to make it part of your model. Then there's things you want to create from, uh, to be able to collect from each subsystem. So if you're using DB2, then you want to collect this from your DB2 monitor. And you want to be able to understand how your puffer pools are doing, how your thread activity is doing. Um, again, watching things that are going to affect performance and you want to understand and build up a model about how your system tends to work in its normal case relative to these parameters. And then there's, of course, your transactional part, the kicks monitor. And here, too, you want to be able to um, gather information like your transaction rate, GPU consum uh, consumption relative to um, kicks, and build uh, essential models for these kinds of parameters. And of course, you may want to create combinations of parameters. You want to be able to create up uh, in your model things that are combined or synthetic variables created as a combination of these kinds of things. So again, these are not the only ones you want to look at, and these are maybe not even exactly the ones you want to look at. It depends a little bit on your system, your installation, and what are the issues that you're worried about. But these are the kinds of things you'd like to be able to measure and build up a model saying, what is the normal behavior for these kinds of parameters and combinations of parameters? And then use that model to understand what is abnormal, and when you see an abnormal activity relative to these parameters that you're measuring, be able to either gather more information or generate an alert relative to the system and let people know that there's an anomaly out there that could be causing a problem in the future. Next chart, please. And then on top of that, um, as I said, what you get are your alert candidates. So you get things there that are essentially saying this is an anomaly and I may or may, I may want to collect more information or I may want to alert. And if I want to alert, um, you need to take alerts very seriously because, as I said earlier, if you overdo it with alerts, people tend to ignore your system. And we see this all the time where you go in and you see red on the monitor and no one cares. And the reason no one cares is because most of the time it doesn't mean anything and they probably understand in this case it doesn't mean anything. And in the other case, you see people scrambling around when everything is white on the monitor, everything is normal, green on the monitor. And this is because it's missed some issues. So you have to be very careful with your alerts. You don't want to underdo it where you want to miss important things, but you certainly don't want to overdo it when you're alerting about things that don't really matter. So on top of being able to understand that there's an anomaly there, once I understand that there's an anomaly, I want to run a set of rules that help me understand what I should do with this. Should I gather more information or should I generate an alert? And this is a, these are examples of kinds of alerts, right, um, that you want to understand. You know, the amount of CPU usage under or over expectations. And I'll just talk a little bit about under expectations because I mentioned it earlier, but it's really important in that when people set up their thresholds, they don't tend to think a lot about the fact that underutilization could be just as big an issue as overutilization. And the reason is, is that my CPU is underutilized when, I know, when, based on past behavior, I know it should be more utilized at this given time. The, the reason that's important is that there may be something else causing down, uh, um, down, downstream that's not allowing me to actually, or not allowing the system to get the transaction. So it's being starved. And if the system is being starved, I'd really like to understand what's causing that starvation. So sometimes underutilization can be just as important as overutilization. And I want to be able to create rules around this so that, again, I'll be under, able to understand what should I do with this information. So there is a mathematically anomaly. It's based on my understanding of the performance, uh, performance issues. But on top of that, I really want to understand and have some rules that will tell me whether or not this is alert worthy. Next chart, please. So here's an example of the kind of information you get when you just sort of gather this information from a system. And if you look at this thing, it's not really very meaningful because there's no model on top of it helping me understand what this actually means. Do another quick bit. So what I, if I put my model on top of this, is of course is a very trivial time-based model. Oh, if I see these are days of the week, I can say, hey, you know, I'm starting to understand that there's some kind of uh, um, pattern here. There's something that I can use perhaps to predict. And if I see this week over week, uh, and, I, and I see this for a, 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 a good number of weeks, I can start understanding, hey, I'm really starting to understand how the system should be performing at given any time of the day. And then once I understand that, I can start using that behavioral analysis to do my prediction. Go to the next chart. 
And here's another kind of example. Now, this one means even less, and there's a little bit of a model there, right? It's talking about Sunday or Monday. But again, I don't really have anything here that helps me understand, is, is there anything on top of this, or is there any model that this fits into that would help me understand how my system usually works? One more click. But if I really tell you that it's a, it fits into a work-related data profile, where essentially, as I said earlier, there's a certain unit of work that needs to be done, and based on the resources available, it will either do that unit of work slowly or quickly, then I can start understanding and say, hey, I now have a model that fits the kind of data that I'm getting, and I can apply this model, and I can understand whether or not what I'm seeing now in my system actually makes sense relative to the things I've seen in the past. Go on to the next chart. So uh, I'm going to very quickly just run through a simple example of being able to use a kind of system that does behavioral analysis and predictive analytics. And so what we're seeing here is essentially this is the system's prediction of, for example, a certain CPU rate, how it should react. And so that's what we're seeing in this green highway here. What we're seeing essentially is the um, boundary of how we expect this specific parameter to act. Would you click that? And here I see what's going on when I do my actual measurements. I see it's fitting very nicely with the model. It's sort of in there, in the specific space relative to the where it should be for this specific parameter type given this time of day and, and, the, and, my, and my system uh, configuration. Next, please. Okay, now I've gone outside the bounds. And so this is clearly uh, an anomaly. I'm outside the normal area. Um, so somehow, Something has happened that's actually caused my system to act differently than I expected it to act given everything I know about past performance of my system. One more click. And so when this happens, and as I said, sometimes it depends on the kind of system you're measuring and, you, and, and the rules that are being used, um, it can decide to give an alert here. And the reason it's decided to give an alert here is because it's been over, and sometimes it's the integral of the area underneath this uh, anomalous behavior. It's been going on long enough, it's been going on deeply enough that it's something that I should alert about. And so this will, over, after a certain amount of time, generate an alert. And again, the alert is really close to the anomaly while the anomaly is still happening, so I'll be able to start gathering the information and be able to look at um, root cause as opposed to symptoms. Click again. Okay, um, this has happened again. Uh, and, and the question here sort of is, there's another anomaly. Do I really need to alert here? One more click. And so this is how the system performed before this anomaly, and this is how it performed right after this anomaly. And so again, the question is asked, do I need to create an alert here? And the answer is, and again, given the system, click again, no. And the reason is, is that alert didn't happen for a long enough duration and wasn't steep enough during its duration to actually cause an alert. So here, even though, even though in both cases there were an anomaly, it's outside the normal bounds that were expected from this parameter. It, here, an alert is generated. Well, here, because it, 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 it was back at normal, it was a very uh, quick spike and then back to normal again, here an alert isn't generated. So those are the kinds of, uh, that's the kind of information that a system can give you um, using rules, not just mathematical anomalies. Another thing that you can use a system like this for is to lower your cost based on behavioral analysis. So here what I'm seeing, based on a uh, four-hour rolling average, is peaks that are happening in my system. Let's again, that. Oops, sorry, my mistake. I go back one. Okay. Um, uh, so what's happening here, if I look at these, red uh, stars, I can see that here I'm in danger of going over my four-hour rolling average. And this these peaks, if something anomalous would happen in my system anywhere around these peaks, I would be pushed over and during my four-hour rolling average, and this could actually cause a, uh, an additional charge. So again, a system like this based on behavioral analysis can tell me where I should be worried, perhaps. Um, if this is my normal behavior, or where I need to be looked if, if this is um, my measured behavior, because in these spots, I'm very close to where, uh, to, to where I'm uh, in, in danger of an overage of my four-hour rolling average, and, and I'm talking about the sub-capacity pricing 
um, that is provided on some software. So if I go over my um, rolling four-hour average, uh, my usage, then I will be charged for, the, uh, for that extra overage. And if it's very close, for example, here, I could say, look, I need to be very careful in these areas here because if anything is happening on my system, something that will not even relevant to this specific application but pushes up my CPU usage, then it can actually push me over. And one example we saw with the customer is essentially um, there was something else going on in the system that was taking these peaks that were close to being overages and actually push them over the boundary for a four-hour rolling average, and this generated extra charges. Now the next chart. So what are the results of using a system like this, of being able to use behavioral uh, um, uh, analysis and predictive analytics? Well, first of all, you get per improved performance because you can find anomalies before they degrade the um, service to users. Now, you can't always fix them before they degrade, but at least you can start working on them. You can get the right people focused on them so that you can actually get the problem fixed faster. Also, users are now calling about problems that are already known to IT. So instead of IT scrambling on every call trying to understand why is my system slow, how come no one knew it was slow, you actually know about the problems before they're affecting the end users. So when the end users' calls do come in, if they do, then you know what they're talking about um, rather than scrabbling to try to understand what they're talking about. And of course, this generates uh, causes uh, lower cost. Um, the reason is because since you've actually captured the information close to the root cause, you actually know more about the problem and you can get the right people looking at the issues on the right um, subcomponents uh, rather than trying to get everyone in a room, in a war room or, or a tiger team, where everyone's trying to figure out what subsystem is the issue, so then they can deep, uh, deep dive and understand the issues. So you can get the right experts fixing it faster. Um, you can have faster resolution to your problems, again, because you can have the right people working on it before the issue actually manifests itself to end users. You can actually fix the problem much, much faster from a lapse time perspective. And in the end, you can save MIPS. And the reason is, is because some of these defects just deep up CPU. And as long as these defects are, aren't found and understood, then you could actually be using up more MIPS than you need. And using up more MIPS is a general problem in capacity, but of course it can also be a very uh, um, time-dependent problem because if you do this within a four-hour uh, time period and you're allowing for subcapacity pricing, you can actually get charged for an overage, even though what was going on wasn't necessarily important to you. Next chart. So an example of things that happened here is that you can find, you can find anomalies faster, uh, and this is an example of a system. It cost 10 anomalies before they degraded service or users. So in other words, they were finding issues before the service was degraded. Um, as I said earlier, calls were coming in after uh, um, the, the uh, uh, users had, uh, the calls were coming in after IT actually knew about the problem rather than users being the first to know. And IT can now say, I'm working on it, and they understand where the problem was, and you can fix things faster. So uh, go ahead to the next chart. So um, that was a quick look. Um, and only in the last chart, I talked a little bit about chronic IT, but we're going to have another webinar where we're going to talk about the solution, the specific solution called Conic IT for behavior analysis and predictive analytics. We'll talk about how the product works, how it puts behavioral analysis to work, uh, to work, and how you get it connected into a system to start building into your behavioral profile and getting the appropriate alerts. This will be in December, so um, look out for the invite invitation so that you can come and see how a real system um, that uses behavioral analysis and predictive analytics works in the real world. Thanks, Jacob. Um, um, if anyone who's interested, there is an evaluation software proof of concept available. Sorry, Deb, go ahead. That's okay. Thanks, Jacob. Appreciate that. Um, again, w what we tried to do today is to give you sort of a high-level um, uh, general understanding of behavioral analytics and predictive analytics. Uh, and as Jacob mentioned, we will have a webinar that will be very product uh, focused on Conic IT in December. Uh, we did get some questions. I want to remind everyone that if you do have questions, uh, submit them via the chat box and we'll be able to answer those now. 
Uh, Jacob, I have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, the first question, can I build a predictive system myself using off-the-shelf BI, I guess that's business intelligence tools? Um, well, the answer is, the short answer is yes, you certainly can. Uh, and people have done this, actually. Uh, and, and what we see happen is that people take off-the-shelf tools um, for business, for statistical analysis or for business intelligence. Um, they gather the information. Sometimes they gather information live. In most cases, they gather information from logs. And then they try to use various kinds of models to predict it, to predict um, behavior and performance behavior. The problem is, is, first of all, it's very difficult to build this as a live system. So almost anyone who does this builds it based on logs using historical information rather than live information. But the real problem is it's very difficult to build these models. Um, generic models, as I said a lot during my presentation, just don't work. You need specific models that actually um, understand things about system performance, and even more than that, understand about system performance on mainframe. And so while it is doable, and there are people that do that, they tend not to get great results. And the reason is is because it's very difficult to, without the domain expertise, the deep domain expertise and the deep statistical in, uh, um, expertise to build up a system that actually um, can work well uh, in a given environment. Okay, thanks. Um, another one uh, that came in, how, and it's sort of similar it looks like, um, how long does it take to get a predictive analytics system for performance up and running? Um, usually, the, the, depending on the kind of system, usually getting it up and running is, is pretty easy, right? It's hooking it into the system, getting the right parameters, um, doing a little bit of tuning, and letting it run. The long part, and, and this is probably relative to the question, is it needs to build up a model. It needs to build up a model of behavior, perform, performance behavior. And the only way to do this is to give it the time to learn. All these systems are learning-based systems. They do it based on, given their models, they do it based on learning on the actual system that it needs to predict. And this can take, depending on the kind of system you're talking about, um, both the system being monitored and the predictive analytic system, usually takes somewhere between three to six weeks to build up a good model of your system before it can actually be used for prediction. Um, the next one that came in, how much extra load does predictive analytics put on my mainframe? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. These things can be relatively compute intensive. So there's two ways to go about doing this. One is to actually run the predictive analytics on the mainframe itself. And in some sense, that has a downside in that if your system's having problems, you don't want it crunching numbers in order to be able to do the predictive analytics um, because it's going to eat up resources that probably could be better used to serve your customers. So we believe the best way to do this is to do it off, um, offloaded from the mainframe. So you don't really want to run the predictive analytics uh, calculations themselves on the mainframe. You'd like to do that on a system outside of the mainframe that gathers information from the mainframe and then runs it on, on some external box so that when the system is having problems, you're not actually creating any additional load on your system because you've offloaded this to a secondary system. Okay, um, here's another one. Um, we currently run a Megamon Health Checker and are implementing PFA. All of this data is being stored and monitored by a Tivoli monitoring environment. Is your product a replacement for all of these products or does it augment them? Um, and, uh, well, th th those are a few different products, right? Um, and it augments them because most of the things that you're getting from the kinds of systems that you're running are system kinds of information um, from PSA and, and from uh, Health Checker. Uh, and what we're talking about here is more transactional kinds of information. So in other words, it's not predictive analytics on the system, it's predictive analytics on your applications. So it's at a different level than those, um, and it's looking for a different set of problems. So the, the tools that you mentioned will be able to find if your system is, is um, suffering for some reason, we'll be able to understand whether your transactions, even though your systems may be normal, your transactions and applications are suffering because of we, uh, um, unusual or unexpected interactions between different parts or different ap application parts of your system or different transactions. Uh, we've got two more questions. Um, 
Who decides which variables of the system performance would be modeled? Will it be your software or the end users? And the second, um, second part question, how will the software choose the variables to model if it does it? Okay, um, it's a combination of the two. So there's a set of variables that, this, that, that our system tends to look at very, relatively closely. So there's a kind of things that we've known over time that tend to be issues in systems, and those are things that most people care about, and so our system actually looks at those sort of out of the box. Then on top of that, there is a short modeling period before, in, while installing the system, where working together with the customer, we come in and say, what are the kinds of things that you worry about? What are the things that you really care about? And then we put those additional parameters into the system. So we're modeling the stuff that comes out of the box along with specific things that the customer needs to have modeled because of uh, the way the system's set up or things that they care about or things that they're worried about. And so those two things combined, that's what generates the set of parameters that are variables that are being looked at. Um, it looks like we have one more question unless folks uh, want to submit more on the, on the chat box. Um, this last one, IBM just announced Z-Aware. Is that the kind of predictive analytics system you're talking about? Um, I guess this is sort of connected to an earlier question about PSA and Health Checker now, now uh, um, Z-Aware, which actually does sort of the, some of the same things that those other ones do. But again, Z-Aware is, like the other ones, a system-based predictive analytics system. It's actually looking at the system itself and measuring lots of interesting parameters, but at the system level in order to understand whether or not the health of your system is normal. The difference is, is that we're looking at the application and transaction level, and we understand whether or not your applications and transactions are behaving as normal, not your system. So I think um, these two tools are very complementary. They look at different parts of the system, um, and, and they try to address different components, one about whether or not your system is behaving normally, and the other one about whether or not your transaction and application are behaving normally. Okay. I'm sorry, Jacob, we just got one last one. I think this might be sure. where we'll end. Um, how does this product work when transaction boundaries are not known? Um, the example, Java applications from distributed using DB2 on the host as a data source. So how does this product um, work when transaction boundaries are not known? So the, uh, I'm not sure I, I, I'm not sure I understand this question completely, and, and then, you know, I'm happy for anyone to send an email and we can, we can talk about this offline. But essentially what I, what I, I think they're trying to say is that if, what, what, we, what we really need to be able to do is to be able to get the information relative to that set of transactions from some monitor. We are not replacing a monitor. So depending on what kind of monitoring system they have installed relative to those kinds of transactions, um, we may or may not be able to get the information there. If we can't get information from the monitor, then of course it's not interesting. But there are monitors that can actually gather the information at a relatively deep level that can help you understand these kinds of transactions. If that kind of monitor does exist, then we can gather the variables and perform the predictive analytics on them. Okay, thank you. Um, that's all the questions that we have. Um, but if you think of some or we didn't get to yours, uh, we're ending our webinar right now in the next couple of minutes, um, please feel free to send us your questions at performancequestions at sdsusa.com. Um, I want to thank you, Jacob. We really appreciate your time today, and I want to thank everyone that was on our webinar today. Um, have a good rest of your day or evening. And if you need to reach us again, it would be at performancequestions at sdsusa.com. Again, thank you.